Hi, it's that time of year again. There's lots of holiday cheer going on and along with that comes the food. Now, one of my personal favorite foods is turkey. And when I think about turkey and wine, I always think of my absolute favorite, which is Pinot Noir. And who makes the best Pinot? Well, that's something we're going to talk about today. So we're gonna jump off the holidays and we're gonna go across the ocean to a part of France that doesn't necessarily celebrate Thanksgiving. It's called Burgundy. Now, Burgundy is an interesting little place. It is in the, what would that be, the east central part of France. In other words, close to the, going further inland away from the Atlantic Ocean and kind of the middle north to south. Now, inside that area over there is a region called Burgundy, and it's sort of kind of like a province or a state would be in the United States. It's not, the entirety of it is not wine growing. For example, the southern part of Burgundy can turn, contains the uh, location known as Beaujolais. Now, you, if you're a wine drinker at all, you've probably run across that term, November being Beaujolais month, and that's a whole different video. I won't go into that now. But I do enjoy something from Burgundy, and that is the wine that is known as Burgundy, kind of takes its name from the place, or Bourgogne. If you were in France, that's how you would say it, or something close to that. Apologies for any bad enunciation in the foreign language. So let's uh, take a look at Burgundy. Let's see if I can talk and open at the same time. I happen to have a bottle here, and I need to open it up. So we'll just get that going. Now, Burgundy itself has kind of a nice, interesting history. It was not one of the more popular wine regions early on because of transportation. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but transportation was as big a factor in Europe anyway for wine as the grapes and the quality of the wine itself. For example, you can make the best wine in the entire universe, but if you couldn't get it to a market, and in the case of France, the biggest market was Paris, if you didn't have a good way to get it there, then uh, you may as well not bother making it because you can't sell enough of it locally to be that profitable. Oh, this is going to be a tough one to come out. Ah, there we go. A little bit longer cork than I'm used to. So let's give it another twist here and see where we're at. Yeah, that's, if you can see there, that's pretty much all the way in. The screw port, the corkscrew is all the way in, and we're not even close to popping out. So longer than normal cork, just side note there. Now this happens to be a 2005 vintage. So let's uh, give it a pour here and get my glass. And we now have an open bottle. Okay, give myself a little sample pour there. Now, it's gonna be hard to see this way, but uh, Burgundy is kind of typified by a very brilliant red color. Now, this one being a little older, it's a little bit darker. Again, this is a 2005. This being 2014, it's nine years old. So hopefully I've not kept it too long, but we'll soon find out. Very nice color. And uh, I may have to tip the camera up, but I don't know if you can see it that much better. So we'll forego that. Oh, love it. Very, very good. Quick taste and we'll go on here. Mm. Well, actually another taste. Okay, this video may get real short. But anyway, let's talk about burgundy. Now, like I said, we had a region called Burgundy. That's kind of like a state, like California in the U.S. But the entirety of that region does not make Burgundy wine. The actual wine that we refer to as Burgundy comes from an area about 25 miles long and uh, two to three miles wide, depending on which part of it you're in. Now, put that in scale, that's roughly the size of Napa Valley in California. It's a little bit bigger, but they're comparable in size. Napa, as I'm sure most people in the U.S. know, cranks out quite a bit of wine. Well, Burgundy does too. Now, the difference being in Burgundy, uh, you've got a little bit more of a specialization. Now, the main wine growing region that uh, we think of as Burgundy is referred to as Cote d'Or and um, basically hills of gold. And that's kind of probably now from the money they make off it. But um, that breaks down into two other regions, which is Cote de Nuit or night and Cote de Bonne, which is, would be roughly beautiful or good or something like that. So now Burgundy wine, as we know it, is comes from two different grapes. The red Burgundy 
comes from Pinot Noir. So that I'm sure you've probably heard of. If not, we'll do a video on that someday too. But very interesting grape, very finicky, very difficult to grow. It uh, just takes perfect conditions, otherwise they get nothing out of it. And uh, the other Burgundy we'll talk about, or just touch on briefly, is White Burgundy, and that's made from Chardonnay. So two different grapes, and uh, red and white, so kind of easy to keep those two apart. Now, historically, this region of France, the Burgundy region, was competing with the region of Champagne and Chablis, which are both to the slightly to the north and more to the west. Now, they were not competing well because, as I was talking about earlier, it's the transportation issues. Champagne and uh, Chablis both had river access down to Paris, and therefore they could use barges and float their, their wine down the river and uh, connect with it, sell it, and make money. It wasn't until later on in the, oh, I'm not sure exactly when, probably the 1700s, 1800s, when the road situation got a lot better and uh, Burgundy was able to ship their wine out via carts or trucks or wagons, not trucks, but wagons of some sort. So that's when they became more well known and it became very popular and it was pretty much the wine of kings. It was somewhat more expensive because of the transportation. Now, today's market, uh, still very expensive. Uh, you're not going to find a true, genuine, cheap Burgundy. Now, some things to consider, and this, um, I won't say it's absolutely unique to, well, it's definitely not unique to, to Burgundy, but it's somewhat unique to France, is they have a very complex wine grading system in the sense that uh, each region, Burgundy and Bordeaux and any of the other regions that you may know of, each has their own variation of it, very complex. But to kind of simplify it down, you've got uh, kind of across the nation of France, you've got a few sort of standard terms. Now, the first one being Grand Cru, spelled like Grand Cru, C-R-U, which is the, the best growth, the first growth, not even the first growth, but the best growth in terms of growth of wine plants. This is followed by the premier or the first growth. And then in some parts you have the, the deuxième cru and so on, the second, third, and fourth growth. Now, the best one is not the first. That's where it gets a little confusing to, um, at least to American mindset. You have to think of it as something like uh, a beauty pageant where you've got the winner of the pageant, you know, Miss America or Miss Universe or whatever. Who comes in second? It's not you know, the second place, it's the first runner up. So you kind of think of it that way. You've got your Grand Cru and your Premier Cru. So your, your, your top winner followed by your first runner up. Now in the Burgundy region, from there it kind of stops on that and it goes to the classification of village or village. So you have the village wine and then you have uh, beyond that uh, stuff that they don't bother naming. So. The way this kind of works out is the best vineyards, the best plants are found higher up in the hills, up the sides of the slopes. So you've got your oat or high vineyards, and then below those are your premier vineyards, and then down in the valley is your village vineyards. So that's kind of the rating and the way it ranks out. If you're getting a um, Grand Cru wine, an oat wine, you're uh, getting the most expensive one because it's the best. So you're paying for what you get in that sense. So, fun stuff. Now, um, because of, and this is a little more history, and this is kind of different from the normal way of thinking. Back in the day, Napoleon, I'm sure most people have heard of him, but Bonaparte had a legal system in place that governed inheritance. So if a um, guy owns, let's say, 100 acres of land and has two sons, then the land would pass equally to his two sons. So each of them would then get 50 acres. And each, if each of those two sons had two sons, meaning four cousins in there, then you would have, ultimately, those four would each inherit 25 acres. And so on down the line until you get to something like present day where you have a person or family inheriting maybe one row of a vineyard. So this makes it a little difficult in terms of how much wine can you make out of that one row. And is it worth a bother if you only got one row of grapevines, you know, how much wine are you going to get out of that? So a system has come into place over the generations or years where you have someone who will come up, come in and buy up all the wine in that vineyard from 
this brother, this brother, this cousin, that cousin, this 12th cousin, and so on, what was originally maybe all one family, buy it all up, and then bottle it under a different label. Now, to do that, of course, it has to meet certain qualifications. It can't not be uh, labeled Grand Cru if it's not all from a Grand Cru vineyard or vineyards. So the, uh, the guys that do this are referred to as negociants. And so to kind of think of it as negotiator, not that they negotiate in that sense, but they are also responsible for collecting the grapes, crushing, bottling, fermenting, not in that order, but uh, and then ultimately marketing the wine. So they're kind of a broker more than a negotiator. But that's the uh, French term for it, negociant, and uh, they're the ones that do that. And you also have a similar type situation going on in Champagne, not too far away, where again, you've got individuals or families that maybe own two plants out of a row or a whole row or half a row or something of that sort. So it's a lot of history there, a lot of interesting Something to think about the next time you want to have a turkey sandwich after the holidays and you want something to wash it down with. You know, I want to go to the expense of a, a burgundy, but you couldn't find anything much better. So cheers. To be a Bordeaux wine, there's a number of things that are involved. First of all, it's got to be made from the right grapes. It's got to be produced in the region. And there's all these little factors that come together. And that's what we're going to talk about. 